so glad that you're here this morning. I got to tell you this morning that um, I'm, I changed my mind, and I know that doesn't matter to you, or maybe I should say the Lord changed my mind, but what I planned to speak to you about today, a couple of days ago, it just seemed like the Lord said that that's not for, that's not for this weekend. And, um, and I, I, there's some serious aspects of what I want to talk to you about today, and it's more fun to talk about the holy hilarity of following Jesus and being born again. But um, this morning we're going to do a little bit of both, but some of the scripture that we want to look at is, is a little more thought-provoking and a little more serious conversation for us to, to look at. You look around the space this morning and, um, you know, I, I, I can tell you that here today you are surrounded by individuals who have built their lives, their vocations in many cases, on inconvenience. Um, I particularly picked on the Cole family this morning, but they're not the only ones. They're one of. Um, you know, I, I think of, of Dwight. Um, you know, and I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, this is just me, but I mean, you know, I, I think about individuals who build their lives on inconvenience. Somebody showing up that wants a haircut when they want it. Um, and um, I mean, and really, it's like, do you want to mess with somebody's hair? Or how about being a dentist? Um, you know, do you, I mean, I, I, I don't know. You know, I, sp- I spoke of the, of the Coles. You know, the, the Cole family have, have built a lot of their business structure around being available in the middle of the night at inconvenient times on the hot holiday weekend when everybody wants to go to the lake with their family and they're fixing somebody's freezer or somebody's cooler or they make themselves available not when it's convenient, but when it's inconvenient. And I call our attention to that this morning because I would suggest that almost anyone we can think of, that we admire, that we respect, that we look up to, that that is almost always built on a high level of inconvenience. And some of you are already thinking, all right, Tim, I know where you're, yeah, you know, it, it, it can be hard, yeah, it, it can be hard. You go to the concert and you, you see that individual that gets up who is an incredible performer, musician, and, and can literally transport us from the moment and the stuff that's going around us to a place of joy. And, you know, well, I want you to understand something. We, we sometimes call that a gift. That always is accompanied by a whole bunch of work. Always. I remember Enos Hirschberger, I, I mentioned him this morning, you know, and I know some of you don't even know Enos, but a, a stellar, gifted guitarist. But I remember over and over again when the kids was off doing stuff and doing what kids do, Enos was playing the guitar. Hours. And when he picks up a guitar, he does things with it that you didn't even know that a guitar could do, and it moves people's hearts, but it was inconvenient. But one of the reasons that, 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 that that's problematic to me and that I'm speaking to myself, you know, often as much as I am to you, sometimes more to myself than I am to me, is um, I am, I have a disease, I am highly allergic to inconvenience. I don't like my schedule changed, especially without my permission. And often I do have to live by the calendar, but often there are a series of events and things that I need to do throughout the course of the day that I need to hurry up and get them done as I'm on my way to the few things that are on my schedule that I love and that I enjoy and the people that I want to talk to and have lunch with and visit with. And so I tend to endure the inconvenience to get to the things that I really love. Now, you do know that if you could enjoy and love the inconvenience, that you would be a much happier person. 
Um, you know, it, it's just been a few days ago that I celebrated my 40th birthday. And that was really tough for me. It was a wake-up call. I recognized that statistically, I was probably halfway done. And there was a lot of things that I wanted to do that I had not accomplished, and it was very sobering. And that was just a few days ago, and in the meantime, my 50th went by, and then my 60th birthday went by, and my next birthday will be my 70th birthday. And that was the perfect opportunity for a, an expression of, oh, I would have never known. And nobody took advantage of it. How did it happen? Because what I am talking about is how quickly time goes by. And when I look back, and I do look back, and when I look back, I can tell you that there are decisions, there are decisions that I made and decisions that I did not make that defined my life. We decided, one of the decisions we decided that we would spend less money than we had coming in. Yeah, I mean, go ahead and laugh. And the reason why that's so significant is because there were a lot of years of my life that I did not spend less than came, than came in. That's another ugly story. I won't, I won't tell you anymore. You, you know. That was a decision that changed the trajectory of our life. Um, Katie and I made a decision to get married. We got married in the kids' worship area up there. Pastor Jim married us. Neither one of us know exactly how many years ago it was. We can figure it out if we have a calendar. And I'm so pleased that she does it because some women give their husbands a hard time because they don't remember their anniversary, but she doesn't. That was an easy decision for us to make because back then we still really liked each other. Now, I'm not telling you that we don't now, but I, but I am telling you there were lots of times in between then and now that, we, that Katie would tell you that she didn't like me. And there were some times that I didn't like her. Fortunately, we were always in love and we had made a decision. And shortly after we got married... Um, She said, we need to go see some counselors. We need to talk to a marriage counselor. And it's not because everything was terrible. It is because we had made a decision that we were going to have a happy home and it was not looking like it was going to be different than some of the things that we had done in the past. And I still remember I still remember very well more than one time of getting in the car and taking off someplace across the country to go see some counselor that I did not know and I already knew that I didn't like him. He was going to be poking his nose in our business, which was none of his business, and I was not feeling good about it at all. But we made the decision early on that the marriage, our marriage was worth it. And I could tell you today, those are decisions that defined our relationship. And if I'm really honest with you, there were some ugly moments of self-discovery. I'm so thankful for them. They changed my life. Uh, we made a decision that's really weird when I think about it. In, in the early days of our relationship, and you know both of us had been married before and had been through divorce, and we started our relationship as a couple of unsaved heathens. And we started writing our governing values. And every time we get together, we would get out that sheet, and we came up with, I think there was seven, wasn't it seven? Seven governing values that we talked about every time we got together, that these were the things that we wanted to govern our life by for the rest of our life. And the number one thing that we wrote down on that, on that piece of paper 
was that we wanted to have a good relationship with God. And that's really weird because we were not, we were not religious Christian people when we started our relationship, but we determined, we decided. And we started coming to church. We started looking for a church, and we ended up coming to this church. And we came to this church a lot. We came to every service when the door was open to revival meetings. And I'm going to tell you right now, we didn't always like the music. Now, I'm not making a comment on the music, although I will tell you, I mean, I, I remember when Doug first started playing a guitar. That's all I'm going to say. Because he made a decision. He made a decision that has changed our church, been a gift to our church. We didn't always like the music, and I did not always love the messages. And not only that, there were some of the people that we came to church with here at Clare Church in the Nazarene that were irritating, busybody, not nice people that we didn't always love or like. There were people that we came to church with that if I saw them coming, sometimes I would make it a point to saunter in some other direction because I knew that if I started talking to them, it would be a long conversation and I didn't want a long conversation with them. But I'm saying all that to you this morning because in the midst of all that, we made a decision that this was our family. And whether we loved everything or not, we needed this place. We needed to worship. We needed to come together with people, even ones that in those days we may not have liked because we were the family of God and we needed to be part of this family. The decisions that we make and keep are what will define the people that we will become. And I think in this season that we're in right now that it is, I think it is more important than perhaps it's ever been for most of us. What decisions that we make and that we keep. In Proverbs, the 24th chapter, we read these words. The writer says here, I went, by, I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard, of the man who lacks judgment. And thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds. And the stone wall around the vineyard to keep out the, the critters and the thieves, it was in ruins. And he says, I applied my heart to what I observed and I learned a lesson from what I saw. He says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you like a thief, and scarcity like an armed man. What do you see there? I mean, this is written a thousand years before Jesus had came here to the earth. It's written by a guy named King Solomon. King Solomon was King David. I think one of the greatest kings there ever was. King Solomon is King David's son. And most of the Proverbs Solomon wrote... And he starts out this by saying, you know, I, I, I was walking, and as I was walking down the road, I went by this vineyard. There should have been 
pruned and manicured and grapes growing, and it was a weed patch. And the stone walls were broken down, no ability to, to keep out predators. And he said, I, I, I observed and I considered what I was looking at. And it seems that he's telling us here, it's not, it's not that the owner of the vineyard made one decision that all of a sudden wrecked his financial world. It's that he slept in. He took the path of comfort rather than the route of labor. And, and notice that it speeds up here. The cadence changes. We, we, we got this slow, a little sleep and a little slumber and a folding of the hands. And poverty will come on you like a thief. What we're talking about this morning is gradual decline and sudden ruin. Gradual decline that becomes sudden ruin. One day you wake up to the fact that you have become an angry, cynical, judgmental old person. That didn't happen in a day. You may realize it in a day, but it didn't, it didn't happen in a day. You may wake up one day to discover that the marriage that you have is in trouble and that you, don't, you do not only not like each other, that love is gone. That marriage did not get like that in a day. You may discover it in a day. You may wake up one day to discover that the faith that you have is not a faith worth having, but that didn't happen in a day. You just discover it in a day. In a 12-step program, this, this, they would sometimes call that a moment of clarity. I may wake up one day and recognize that I'm a drunk. But that didn't happen in a day. Though I may recognize it, and hopefully I do recognize it on a day, it didn't happen in a day. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands, and all of a sudden... I wake up and I feel like I've been mugged. And, and the writer here takes a different tone. If you notice, he gets preachy. He brings a warning into this. The pronouns change. He starts out and he's saying, I applied my heart to what I observed and I learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And then it's like, it's like all of a sudden he recognizes there's people around me that are in trouble. A little sleep, a little slumber, slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, and poverty will come on you. And here the pronoun shifts. The, pro, the will come on you like a thief. And scarcity like an armed man. It's kind of like he is saying to us, you don't want to wake up one day and be a lonely, old, miserable person with no friends and no meaningful relationships. It's almost as if he's pleading with us, you don't want to be that person. And, and you know, something in our hearts can feel sorry for the owner of the vineyard. Because if we were to shake him from his apathy, he'd probably go, um, I didn't do anything. It's like, yeah, I know. Because that, that brings us to, a, to another thing that he's talking about here, and I'm just going to simply call it this, weeds happen. You don't have to plant them. 
Any of you that are gardeners know what I'm talking about. You can rototill that soil and it's, it's immaculate and there's not a blade of grass in it and you plant your crops. You say, well, what, what did he do? Nothing. He didn't have to do anything. Weeds happen. You know, you don't have to do anything for your finances to fall apart. They'll do it all by themselves. You don't have to do anything for your marriage to crumble. It'll do that all by itself. You know, some of you, a few years ago, I went to the doctor and, and the doctor said, ah, heart problem, you're going to need some stents. And I found myself in the hospital and, and now I'm carrying around some metal in there someplace. I got to be careful about MRIs and things, you know, many of you. But, but don't feel sorry for me. Say, oh, Tim, I'm sorry. Don't be sorry. The doctor had told me for years, your cholesterol is too high. I want to put you on some medication. But I'm a man. I don't need no pills. I'll exercise. I'll change my diet. I have stints. <laughs> I grew up in the church. And my life, my, my life revolved around the church. My world was the church. When I was 19 years old, I took my first pastorate. And I had committed my life to this way of life and this religious experience. And I never made a decision that I was ever going to do anything else, but I found myself in failure, surrendering my credentials, turning them back in, going through a divorce, never expecting to ever be any part of church leadership again. Because I did, didn't take care of the weeds. What we think about, where our thoughts are, those are weeds. How many of you know this guy? Just shout his name out if you do. Anyone? I, I, there, I thought there might be some other nerd here. Robert Frost. He gives us some well-known poetry. He, he, wrote, he wrote these words. It's called The Mending Wall. It says, some, something there is that doesn't love a wall. This sends the frozen ground swell under it and spills the upper boulders in the sun and makes gaps even two can pass abreast. Oh, and then the work of hunters is another thing, you hunters. I have come after them and made repair where they have left not one stone on a stone, but they would have the rabbit out of hiding to please the yelping dogs. The gaps, I mean. No one's seen them made or heard them made. But at spring mending time, we find them there. I let my neighbor know beyond the hill, and on a day we meet to walk the line and set the wall between us once again. We keep the wall between us as we go. And he continues on. See, the vineyard, the vineyard is intended to produce fruit. It's intended to grow grapes and it's a, it's a weed patch. And not only is there no fruit, but there's no ability to protect himself. And those are the things that can happen to us. Not only can we become fruitless, but not have any way to sustain ourselves or to protect ourselves when things are going in unusual ways. The Word of God tells us that in the last days that there will be a falling away. 
I think that's significant because we can look around and we can say, look at them bad, evil people out there. But that's not what the Scriptures, that, that's not a falling away. Those are unsaved people who do not follow the Christ. The falling away is referring to the fact that the people of God have forsaken, have fallen away. The weeds have grown. In Timothy, we read, mark this. There will be terrible times in the last days. People will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, without love, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not lovers of the good, treacherous, rash, conceited, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness, some kind of religious thing going on, but denying the power, having nothing, have nothing to do with such people. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control, who are loaded down with sins and they're swayed by all kinds of evil desires. Always learning, but never able to come to a knowledge of the truth. These teachers oppose the truth. They are men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. I, I think we're living with some of these things going on. That, that's, not a, that's not a commentary to, to, to be sad about, but the realization that Jesus said, when you see these things, look up. Look up. Because your redemption draweth nigh. How do we respond? How do you and I respond in these seasons? How do we respond with some of the things that we, that we have going on around us? You know, you, don't, you do not get to heaven by being religious. You don't get to heaven by paying your tithe. You know, we love it when you pay your tithe. You're giving people. But you don't get to heaven that way. You don't get to heaven because you belong to a small group. You don't get to heaven because you sing the worship songs with gusto. You don't get to heaven because you hung around with some religious people. You don't get to heaven just because you read the Bible. But I do want to say to you this morning, if you stop those things, it, it troubles me right now, and it sounds like I'm meddling a little bit, but with all the stuff that's went on, and we don't even still know where the truth lies in a lot of areas, but people have made decisions. I, I've talked to them all the time, again this week, individuals who haven't been to church in weeks and months, said, you know, Pastor, I, I know we, I, I, you know, we, we got out of the habit. And don't misunderstand me. You need to take care of your health and you need to protect yourself. And, and I'm not talking about that at all. What I'm talking about is folks who, who got out of the habit of getting together with God's people, who got out of the habit of their small group, who got out of the habit of the time with God's word. They got out of the habit but they still go to the grocery store and they still go to the restaurant and they still get together with family. In other words, it, it's, it's not, this isn't, this isn't about COVID, but somehow we had permission in this season. Our world changed, our values changed, and I want to suggest to you it will not go back to what it was before. If you think that, think again. It never does. It will be different. And it can be better for you and I, but that will be a choice that we will have to make. Because all of those things that we are talking about are not the things that save us, but they are the things that sustain us, and they are the things that a people who love the Lord do. And we don't do them because I love the pastor, I love the music, I love the people. I hope that those things are, are, are meaningful, but if they're not, this is your family prayerfully, prayerfully pray for God to fix what needs to be fixed because this is our family and our family is what's at stake here. But do not stop pulling the weeds. Don't stop mending the wall. Jesus, in some of his very last words to his disciples, he said this, he would, he would be hanging on a cross 
in ours. And he says, uh, th this is to my Father's glory, that you, that's us, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. I, I think they were probably walking by a vineyard when Jesus said that to them. And then we get this tender moment. And Jesus said, I no longer call you servants. You're not my servants. Because a servant does not know his master's business. But then you know. Instead, I have called you friends. That's a pretty cool thing to be able to say. People borrow credibility all the time on who they know. Oh, yeah, yep, I, 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 know, I know that. I know the sheriff. I know the governor. I know. And you can, I can say, I am a friend of God. Because vibrant living will be built not on the disciplines, but on the relationship. I still find myself, it's been 40 plus years, and I still find myself often driving down the road and looking back at the stupid, selfish, inconsiderate decisions that I made that hurt people, that hurt the cause of Christ, that hurt my children, and make no mistake, hurt me. And I am filled with regret. And I find myself thinking sometimes, how did you not see the weeds? How did you not see the holes in the wall? But I followed the crowd. And that isn't always talking about following a bad crowd. I just followed the religious crowd. <clears throat> Done what was the right thing to do. But I was following the crowd when I should have been following the Christ. And, and that is the question. Today, in this season, how is your vineyard? Are the weeds growing? Is the wall broken down? I'm, I, I, I'm not saying that reprimanding. I'm simply saying, how, how's the vineyard? How's the wall? Are you, are you just following the religious crowd? That's a good crowd to follow, but that's not enough. Or are you following the Christ? Because today, whatever happens, whoever ends up being our president, or not, whatever happens to our constitutional rights and some of the things that we can think are in jeopardy. And I think they are. But see, it doesn't matter. And you understand, of course, it matters deeply. But what I'm saying is by comparison, this morning we can know that it is well with our soul and that with God's help we've kept the weeds pulled and the walls mended because Christ was and is always there with arms outstretched eagerly pursuing us 
He said it, and he said it, and he says it again. Will you follow me? Are you following Christ or the crowd? So, Lord, today, um, I, know we've, I know we've been a little bit, maybe a lot serious. But, Lord, I, help, I pray that you help us to understand how serious our relationship with you is. We do not get to control a lot of the things in the world. We do not get the right to control many of the circumstances around us. But our vineyard can be lush with fruit, safe, because we're following you. And so I'm asking you to speak to each one of us today, whoever we are, wherever we're at, not to be reprimanded, but to be warned. If we see holes in the wall and barren vines, God help us to pour ourselves out before you and to follow you today. Thank you, Lord. We love you in your name. Amen. Have a great week. We will see you next Sunday.